Good morning, everyone. Welcome to HSHQ webinar. We are glad to have many esteemed attendees with us today for our webinar on banking secrecy and PDPA 2010. So my name is Kwa Yi, pupil in chamber of Halim Hong and Kwe, and I will be the moderator for today's section. Before we kickstart this section, please be informed that all participants will be muted. And if there are any questions, please type in the Q&A chat box and we will discuss them during the Q&A section later. Now, please allow me to introduce our speaker, Mr. Lam Man Chan and Ms. Teo Xiang Li. Firstly, Mr. Lam Man Chan, also a partner of Han Hong and Kwe, his practice mainly resolves around corporate litigation and critical matters such as liquidation and restructuring, debt recovery, insolvency, and employment disputes. For Ms. Teo Xiang Li, she is a partner of Halim Hong and Kwe, specializes in the corporate banking and corporate and commercial. Her knowledge and expertise in the corporate banking field are put to good use when she advises a variety of banks and financial institutions on a broad range of legal issues, all ranging from loan and security documentation to compliance related matters, requirements and procedures. She excels in local and offshore bilateral and syndicated credit facilities for financial institutions and corporate borrowers. So now, please join me to welcome our speakers, Mr. Lam Man Chan and Ms. Teo Xiang Li. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, today with me is Ms. Teo uh, Xiang Li, who is our partner. And uh, today we will basically touch on a uh, few topics um, as shown in the, in, the, in the slide, we will be touching on the Personal Data Protection Act 2010 and also the seven important principles therein. And uh, my colleagues will share on bankers' duty of secrecy and also confidentiality as well as bank, banking secrecy and uh, PDPA. Okay, moving forward. Um, yes, we will talk about this Personal Data Protection Act Okay, before the implementation of Data Protection Act, data protection obligations were present among specific sectoral secrecy and confidentiality obligation only. So your personal information was protected only as a confidential information through civil actions and also contractual obligation in regards to breach of confidence. So um, PDPA was basically introduced to strengthen consumer confidence in business transactions and e-commerce, given the increasing number back then, increasing number of credit card frauds and also um, identity theft frauds. And also uh, there are instances where personal data were being sold without the user's consent. So um, we can see that data protection is very important. First, to prevent abuse of personal data. Second, to ensure that those data after being obtained were kept securely by data users. Okay, and third and fourth, it's also very important that those data are accurate, up to date, and um, yeah, the data subjects rights is also important and should be protected as well. Okay, moving forward, um, we shall look at the applicability of uh, PDPA in short. Okay, so PDPA basically it will be applicable to anyone who possesses or anyone who has control authorizes the processing of personal data in commercial transactions. This is um, very important. Okay, but however, this personal data protection, it is not applicable to our federal and also state government. And it is also not applicable to personal data processed outside of Malaysia or those uh, personal data who is not intended to be processed in Malaysia. In short, it will be applicable on data in Malaysia. Okay, moving forward, before we go further into PDPA, it is very important for us to, to, to identify three uh, main areas, data subject, data user, and also data processor. So it's very simple. Data subject is individual who is subject of personal data. For an example, today I'm giving my personal data, uh, for example, my name, my ident IC number, my address, so on and so forth. So I would be the data subject. And whoever receiving those data, Okay, I mean, by definition, it's person who processes personal data or has control or authorizes the processing of such data. So this person, okay, we would identify as data user. 
Okay, there's this third category, data processor. This data processor is someone who the data user authorizes to process those data. I mean, in this, in short term, it will be a third party assigned by the data user to process my data. I mean, I being a data subject, my personal data. Okay, so um, moving forward, we looked at the definition of personal data as, as uh, mentioned earlier. Any information in respect of commercial transaction um, indirectly or indirectly related to a data subject, I mean, who is sufficient to identify the data subject, those we will define as personal data. Okay, on this, it is very important that it, this personal data also includes sensitive personal data and expression of opinion about the data subject. Right, on this, I'll touch a bit on uh, sensitive personal data. Sensitive personal data is defined as uh, personal data, of course, but it's more, more, more sensitive. I will give you a few examples that would include uh, physical or mental health of a data subject, his political opinions, his religious belief, and perhaps his... Uh, his uh, criminal record, if any. Okay, so section 40 of the PDPA is very, is very clear that, okay, this sensitive personal data can only be uh, processed by a data user if uh, explicit consent of the data subject is obtained. That, that's number one. And number two, okay, the act, section 40 also lay down um, scenarios where data, sub, data user can process such sensitive um, Personal data, but however, to save time, I will not. I will not um, go through the, the the all the circumstances. I mean, in short, for an example, if um for example, if you're hiring someone, and of course you would like to know that uh, whether he or she has any criminal records. So in I mean, that is one scenario where sensitive personal data can be can be processed. Okay, so moving forward, um, we will look at the seven important principle of personal data protection. Okay, it is encapsulated under section five of PDPA, where it states that the processing of personal data by a data user should comply the following seven principles. For any violation, okay, of all these principle, uh, any of the principle that I mean, is actually an offense and can be liable to to fine not exceeding three hundred thousand and also imprisonment, not exceeding two years or both. So this is quite a serious offense looking at this. Okay, so moving forward, we will look at the first important principle, which is a general principle. So this general principle, it pro basically prohibits the processing of personal data without the consent of a data subject. And of course, again, there are exceptions. The exceptions are, are stated here. In. Okay, there are six ex exceptions here. Okay, you don't need to comply to this uh, general principle if the Processing of the data is for performance of contract, which the data subject is party. Okay, second, at the request of a data subject with a view of entering into a contract. Next, compliance with any legal obligation other than contract. Okay, or to protect the vital interests of the data subject, administration of justice, of course, and exercise of any functions conferred to any person under the law. So, so long as the purpose is a... Uh, is, uh, I mean, lawful, then it can be it can be accepted, excluded. Okay, next we looked at the, still we are on a general principle, a personal data shall not be processed unless for lawful purposes directly related to activity of a data user. Second, necessary or directly related to purpose. And also it must be remembered that such purpose must be adequate and it should not be excessive in, re in relation of the purpose. Okay, moving forward, we will talk about the second principle, which is the notice and choice principle. Ultimately, the data user should provide written notice to the data subject to inform that the personal data of the data subject is being processed, the purpose for which the personal data is being collected or processed, source, the data subjects rights to access and correction of the such personal data, contact details of data user for inquiry just in case if the data subject is uh, interested to file any complaints or inquiries as to his or her own personal data, then they can easily they can easily reach the data data user. Okay, plus 
of third parties to whom data user discloses or may disclose. This is a very impo uh, important responsibility to, to, to impose on data user. They must, they must first classify if they were to disclose such personal data, which are those people who they, they, they may want to disclose. This must be informed to the data subject beforehand. Okay, last but not least, whether it is obligatory for the data subject to provide the personal data. And if it's compulsory, the, what is the consequences for such failure to do so? And most importantly, this um, notice, it must be given as soon as, as soon as possible, and it should be given in dual language, meaning our national language, Bahasa, Malaysia, and also English. Okay, next, we look at the third principle, which is the disclosure principle. Okay, it basically prohibits the disclosure of personal data without the data subject's consent. But of course, um, there, are, there, are, there are exceptions. The exception is that the purpose for which the personal data was to be disclosed at the time of collection or related purposes. Next, okay, we shall look at the principle of security principle. Okay, it is very important that such data, personal data, after being collected, to be well protected by the data user. So in this case, the data user shall develop and implement a security policy to protect such personal data from any loss, misuse, modification, unauthorized or accidental access or disclosure, alteration or destruction. So um, in short, means must be there to, product, uh, to protect such uh, personal data. And also in the event that, just now we mentioned about data process, processor, so in the event that um, the data user authorized data processor to process the data, so the data user uh, has the responsibility to make sure that the data processor actually has the means or sufficient guarantees as to the security of such personal data. Okay, next we should look at the fifth principle, the retention principle. Of course, um, after getting the personal data, they must be, I mean, it will be kept by a data user, but how long? Can a data user keep those uh, personal data? Of course, under the PDPA, there's no uh, express clause to say that they, they, they must, they must uh, dispose such personal data for how long, but um, it should not be. The general principle is that such, such pers uh, personal data shall not be kept longer than it is necessary for the fulfillment of the purpose. Okay, if, I mean, of course, if um, it is, those personal data is no longer required, Okay, so a data user should ensure that all personal data is destroyed or per permanently deleted. So this is the requirement. Okay, next we looked at the data integrity principle. Okay, in short, there are only four things to look at. A data user should ensure that a personal data is always accurate, complete, not misleading, and kept up to date. These are four, these are four criteria that they have to fulfill. Okay, next we looked at the access principle. So of course, by all means, a data subject shall be given access to his own personal data and to correct such person, personal data if it is inaccurate, incomplete, misleading, or outdated. Of course, like what we mentioned earlier, okay, um, the data user, of course, is obligated to tell the data subject okay, who to go for in case they have any complaints. So this is the reason why um, the requirements is there. So if there are any inquiry or, uh, or any complaints or requests for such mm -hmm. access, okay, the data user is actually obligated to comply to such requests. Okay, but however, I mean, still there is actually a, a, a exception where circumstances where a data user may refuse to comply with such data access requests. Of course, I will not go into, I will, I will not go into, uh, uh, all the circumstances, I'll give, give an example. For example, let's say today you as a data user, you receive an inquiry to access the personal data, but however, you, you are not satisfied of the identity of the requester. So in this case, in the event, if uh, you can't ascertain the identity, so it is, it is also very dangerous for you to simply just um, review the personal data to, to such requester. So this is one of the examples where you can, you can uh, deny such uh, requests. Okay, so this that is basically the seven principles that we are touching on. Moving forward, we will talk about a very important requirement, which is the registration of data user. 
So under section 14 of BDPA, it is and also the personal data protection order 2013, it is compulsory that the banking and financial institution to be registered as data users. So depending on the, the, the classification, of course, we have uh, Financial Services Act 2013, Islamic Financials, uh, Financial Services Act 2013, as well as Development Financial Institution Act 2002. So banks basically and uh, investment banks, of course, they are, they, are, they are obligated to register themselves as data users. Okay, so moving forward, we will look at the uh, examples of, of offenses under PDPA. So these are the uh, examples. Like uh, mentioned earlier, contravention of personal data protection principle, any of the seven principles, there will be uh, 300,000, two years imprisonment or both liability. So next, we can look at the failure of a specified class of data users to register. Failure to register will attract even uh, heavier penalty, which is 500,000, a fine of 500,000, imprisonment of uh, not exceeding three years or both. Okay, next, we looked at the failure to comply to commissioner's requirement to cease processing of personal data. Later, we will, we will talk about the commissioner's uh, role in, in governing okay, the data users. And uh, as of now, we will talk about unlawful collection of disclosure of personal data. Of course, without registration, any collection or disclosure of personal data, data would be deemed um, unlawful and is uh, punishable under PDPA. Next, of course, very importantly, because as we mentioned earlier, the personal data collected in Malaysia is meant to be used in Malaysia only. So unlawful transferring of personal data to overseas would attract um, penalty as well. So um, like mentioned earlier, the PDPA is actually governed by a person known as Personal Data Protection Commissioner. And so, uh, this commissioner is acting and responsibly, uh, responsible Red authority in Malaysia for implementing and also executing. Of course, um, this commissioner also has a right to, to, to enforce the PDPA because without enforcement, there would be no meaning of such PDPA as well. Okay, and uh, being part of the power of the commissioner, they can actually investigate any complaints of uh, violation under the PDPA and also to, to advise whether any remedial steps can be done by any data user. Okay, of course, um, we actually see instances of uh, enforcement actions against data users for offences under PDPA 2010. I mean, although for the time being, we only see um, those violations were punished with only a fine, but still, PDPA shall not be taken lightly and uh, data user must, must ensure that there must be effort to ensure compliance. So um, on this, I will end my sharing and pass the baton over to my colleague, Sang Lee, who will share on the banker's duty on secrecy and confidentiality. Thanks, Sang Lee. Thanks, Man Chan. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Theo Sang Lee here. Let me continue with the sharing on the banker's duty of secrecy and confidentiality. As we know, a banker's duty of secrecy in Malaysia is a statutory duty, which is under and regulated under Financial Services Act 2013. So a banker basically owns a duty of secrecy to his customer at all times, including a duty to keep information concerning his customer affairs confidential. This duty is also contractual in nature, and it will emerge or imply by a banker's and customer relationship. So we look into this section 133 of the Financial Services Act. This act basically says that it prohibits a person who has access to any documents or information relating to the affairs or account of any customer of a financial institution, which including financial institution or any person who has, who is, or has been a director, officer, or agent of a financial institution, whether during his tenure of office or during his employment or after, from disclosing to another person any document or information relating to the affairs or account of any customer of the financial institutions. So in short, it basically says that a bank officer who has the access 
of the customer information, that information including any FIS or account of the customer. The bank, that such bank officer is prohibited from disclosing the information of the customer to any other person, whether during his employment in the bank or is even after his termination of the employment with the bank. Section 133 of the Financial Services Act is a statutory duty of secrecy imposed on all the banks, bank, bankers, bank officers, and financial institutions, but there are exceptions to this Section 133. So when we look into that, Look into the exceptions is found under Section 134, Schedule 11 of the Financial Services Act. Under certain circumstances, the bankers and the financiers may disclose certain information regarding to the customer, and such permitted disclosures are stated uh, under the Financial Services Act. There are basically 18 permitted disclosures under Schedule 11 of Section 134. So this Schedule 11 has two columns, if we, if we see under the Act. First column is what are the information that a bankers can disclose. Second column is to whom they can disclose to. So I just uh, give a summary, a summarize of the 18 permitted disclosures here. First one is documents or information which is permitted in writing by the customer the executor or administrator of the customer. Second is in connection with an application for grant of probate methods of administration or distribution order. This is in pertaining to situations when the customer has passed away. Uh, there might be an executor where there is a will or uh, the intended beneficiaries when there is no will. They can write into the bank to request for certain details of the this customer in order for them to make an application for the grant of probate or grant of LA. Third, in case a customer is declared bankrupt or has been wound up in Malaysia or in any country outside Mal Malaysia. Fourth, any criminal or civil proceedings between a financial institution and its customer, surety, guarantor relating to the customer transaction. If compliant by a licensed bank or licensed investment bank, which has been served a garnishee order, attaching monies in the account of the customer, this is very common when the bank has been served with a garnishee order. Six, compliance with court order by the court, not lower than a sessions court. Seven, compliant with an order or request made by the enforcement agency in Malaysia under any written law for the purpose of investigation or prosecution of an offence under any written law. Eight, performance of functions of Malaysia uh, Deposit Insurance Corporation. Nine, disclosure by a licensed investment bank for the purpose of performance of the relevant functions. Uh, that will be a securities commission under the securities law. Uh, under the Securities Commissions Act, the Stock Exchange and Derivative Exchange approved under the Capital Markets and Services Act, Clearing House approved under the Capital Markets and Services Act, Central Depository approved under the Security Industry Central Depositories Act, and 10 is a disclosure by bank or investment bank for the purpose of performance or function of an approved trade depository under the Capital Markets and Services Act. 11 is a document or information required by Inland Revenue Board under Section 81 of the Income Tax Act 1967. 12 is a disclosure of credit information of a customer to a credit reporting agency registered under the Credit Reporting Agencies Act for the purpose of carrying on the credit reporting business. 13 is a performance of any supervisory functions, exercise any of the supervisory powers or discharge of any supervisory duties by the relevant authority outside Malaysia, which such exercise uh, functions corresponding with those of the Bank Negara Malaysia under the Financial Services Act. 14 is a conduct of centralized function, which include audit, risk management, finance or informa information technology, or any other centralized function within the financial group. 15, due diligence exercise approved by the board of directors of the financial institution in connection with merger and acquisition, capital rising exercise, sale of assets or, or whole or part of the business. 16 is performance of functions of the financial institutions which are outsourced. 17 is a disclosure to a consultant or adjuster engaged by the financial institution. 18 is a financial institution has a reason 
uh, to suspect an offence has been committed under any written law. In short, the bank is allowed to divulge or disclose the information legally to a third party when the is a summary of the circumstances which arise, if it is directed by a court order, if consent is given by the customer, if the bank initiates an action to recover monies owned by the customer, which include issuing of notice of demands, summons to be, summons to be tendered in court, pleadings to be tendered in court, which contains the details of the customer and the details of the outstanding debt, and also the exceptions that we have just discussed, the 18 permitted disclosure under the Financial Services Act. Yes, you see, for the bank to allow a disclosure legally to a third party, I think the most important and pertinent thing for the banks to take is to get a consent from the customer. How does this disclosure and consent to be given by the customer? We can look into the bank uh, so-called standard documents, the standard facility agreement, letter of offer, your terms and conditions, that we usually have a clause to say that disclosure clause. So in that disclosure clause, we will usually say, stated that the borrower hereby agree, consent and permit the banks to disclose the borrower's information to a list, the exhaustive list of parties that the bank can disclose to. That may include any authorized personnel by the bank, they may include any credit agencies, any even debt collections agency, or any partners, uh, associated partners with the banks and all that. So with that disclosure itself, it will safeguard the bank's rights. So the bank can legally disclose to the third party. When the borrower signing the facility agreement or they accept the terms and conditions in the letter offer, that would actually permit the bank to disclose their information legally to the third party, which is listed in the agreement or in the letter offer itself. So the, bank can, so the bank can raise all these applicable so-called exceptions and qualifications as a defense against any claim by its customer. To me, I think the permitted disclosures and all these exceptions is actually quite wide. So yeah, before I move on to the next one, uh, let me do a brief summary in Mandarin as requested. It's a contractual obligation, it's a contractual obligation. It's a contractual 其中得到的所有的资料如果曾与客户接触跟得到任何客户的账户等等其他的资料是禁止将相关的资料泄露给任何其他人的刚刚我们有讲到在这马来西亚二零一三年金融服务法第一百三十四条里头它也列出十八项情况下银行是可以允许跟合法的透露客户的资料的所以那十八项当然我说它其实也蛮长的所以我这里在华语版本这里我就不
。所以下来呢，如果银行在采取法律行动向客户追讨这欠款的过程中，他也会透露客户的资料，包括客户的客户的这呃。银行账号户口、账号的资料、账号的欠呃债务债务状况、欠款等，这也是可以透露的。然后下面就是那十八项啊、呃，金融服务金融服务法规定的例外情况下，客银行是可以透露客户的这资料和其他的事物的。所以刚好看到，刚刚我看到的是，我可以我觉得这个 exception 这个例外情况是相当广的。所以银行可以提出适用的例外情况，作为对客户索赔的一个抗辩。So let's move on with a banking secrecy and PDPA 2010. So under the PDPA, uh, Personal Data Protection Act, it is illegal for a commercial organization to disclose personal information or to allow the use of such data by third parties. This is pertinent when we are dealing with individual customers, consumer loans, or individual accounts. It also pertinent to the bankers when they are handling the data of the guarantors when they are individual guarantors. Yeah, under the PDPA, as explained by, by my colleague Manchon earlier, there are seven personal data principles that need to be adhered by the bankers. So these are the seven, uh, these are the seven personal data protection uh, principles that should be strictly complied by the bankers. Yeah, Manchon has already explained earlier, so I will just move on with the next part. Yep. Other than the duty of a bank banking secrecy, that is towards the as we talk about towards the customer. When there is a bankers and customer relationship, the duty of secrecy and confidentiality between the banker towards the customer. This duty of secrecy is is uh, under the law, under the Financial Services Act. But all banks will also implement a code of conduct. This uh, code of conduct, which require not just a secrecy about customer information, accounts, and affairs, but it also restricts the bank, the bankers, the bank employee about disclosing the bank's internal information. This is pertaining to the confidentiality on the bank's information, such as those sensitive internal information of the bank, which an employee can obtain during the cost during the course of employment with the bank. So, 刚刚我们看到了这个银行保密啊、呃，银行保密款，还有我们看到这个 PDPA。PDPA 呢，就是一个个人资料保护法。所以，这个个人资料保护法呢，它有七项个人资料保护原则，这也是银行职员都需要严谨遵守的。由于有这个保密的义务，大致上所有的银行也有自己嗯、呃、各自的这个 code of conduct， 也哦、呃、翻译成一个行为行为准则。所以这不这行为准则呢，不仅是啊，这、呃、bankers 就是这银行职员呢，对客户的账户或事物的保密，他也要求对银行的信息作为保密，特别是当在银行任职的时候，在银行内部得到所有银行的这些啊、呃、sensitive internal information， 这些啊、呃、敏感的敏感的信息等等，所以这所有的银行职员也是禁止，不能泄露任何在。在呃任职期间得到所有的敏感信息也是不得泄露的。Yeah, I will share with you all a few cases which uh yeah I found interesting under the duty of secrecy and confidentiality and what are the general principles that it is applicable in under the laws of Malaysia. The first case that I'm sharing this UK case. This is a Turner versus National Provincial and Union Bank of England. This is a landmark case which lay down the defined. The scope of bankers' duty of secrecy and confidentiality to its customer. This has laid down a general principle, which is adopted by most of the Malaysian law, Malaysian cases subsequently, and also adopted by the Singapore cases as well. So in this case, the bank disclosed to the plaintiff employer about the plaintiff information which he had obtained from the drawer of a check made in favor of the plaintiff. So as we know, the information sometimes the information may be a negative information. Hence, after receiving the information from the bank, the plaintiff employer did not renew the plaintiff contract of employment. The plaintiff then commenced an action for breach of confidentiality. In this case,、uh, as we see, the disclosure made by the bank officer to the plaintiff employer has resulted the plaintiff contract was not renewed. 
by the plaintiff employer. In this case, the court held that the right of a customer to have his affairs quite confidential is a legal right, which is not absolute but qualified. It was further held that the duty of secrecy is not confined to actual state of the customer account, but it also extends to information derived from the account itself. These are the general principles that is applicable in all uh, our Malaysia duty of secrecy and confidentiality as well. Hmm. This is one of the Malaysia case Tanang Siong against Malayan Banking Berhad. In this case, the plaintiff who was the bank employee had left and orally closed his bank account with the bank without giving a written instruction. The bank did not close the account because there was no written authorization from the plaintiff. Lying dormant, there are service charges and interest accumulated to a 15 ringgit outstanding in the account of the plaintiff. The bank credit officer knowing the plaintiff brother, as the plaintiff brother is a company who are also having an account with the bank officer. So that bank officer went on to disclose the plaintiff information that an account with an outstanding of 15 ringgit to the plaintiff brother. Knowing this, the plaintiff comments, comments and actions uh, against the bank for breach of confidentiality. In this case, there is a breach. The court allowed the claim by the plaintiff and, but only granted a nominal damages of 15 ringgit to the plaintiff. Of course, the facts of this case, they are not purely, uh, the plaintiff are not purely suing the bank for the breach of confidentiality. They are also suing for slander and defamation as if the, the bank officer has committed a defamation against the plaintiff because he, he wrongfully disclosed, like illegally disclosed his information to the plaintiff brother. And, to the court, disclosing uh, information under these circumstances in this place, it does not amount to a defamation. Hence, uh, the defamation claim does not succeed. Only, uh, only on the part of breach of confidentiality, the plaintiff has succeeded in the claim, but nominal damages has been granted. So, when we look into the next case, you will see when it could the court in assessing what are the damages has actually suffered by the plaintiff before the court will decide what is the adequate damages to be awarded to the plaintiff. In the Jayamari case, it is a sessions court matter which is unreported, but it was published in the newspaper. The a bank official it printed out the account particulars of a customer and passed it to a friend who was a private investigator. So his friend went on to pass it to a blogger and hence resulted the statements in the customer account has been published in a social media. So in this case, the bank officer was sentenced to two days imprisonment and a fine for 20,000. So, yeah. So you will see uh, in deciding what are the damages to be awarded by the court, it will also look at what are the actual damages and the loss suffered by the plaintiff before when uh, in the as a result of uh, the breach by the bank. So when we look into this, the bank's uh, duty to maintain secrecy and confidentiality not only encompasses the information and facts he learned from the state of the customer account, but it also includes and extends to all information he gained from other source, than the, other source than the customer actual account by virtue of the banking relationship. Yep. Before I move forward, I just briefly explain in Mandarin. 刚才向大家分享了这个案例呢其中一个是一个英国案例但这英国案例它是一个标志性的英国案例因为它规定了银行或者是银行职员对客户保密和保密义务的范围所以它的原则来说呢客户对这事物的保密权利是一项合法的权
So lastly, in the event the banker's breaches his duty of secrecy, the customer may be entitled to claim for damages if he has suffered losses. So when a customer successfully sue a banker for a breach of duty of secrecy, the amount of damages which he is entitled to recover will depend on whether he is able to establish an actual extent of the damages he has suffered as a result of the disclosure. So as we look into our earlier cases precedent, if we look into it, we know that in order to, when there is a breach, if a customer successfully sued the bank and in the event the court rule in favor of the customer, in some extent, the customer has also need to prove what are the actual laws that we have suffered. In bringing a suit against another one, although a breach of a statutory duty is a breach, but in some extent, it will also require the customer to have proof that what are the actual losses that he has suffered in order to get uh, adequate uh, damages to be awarded by the court. Yeah, be that as it may, a breach of a statutory duty is a breach of law. So since the duty of secrecy is clearly stated under the Financial Services, under the Financial Services Act, it is a statutory duty under a law. When there is a breach, it will result a very severe penalties. If we look into the penalties, the penalties for non-compliance of the secrecy provisions would amount to a fine not exceeding 10 million, 10 million ringgit Malaysia or imprisonment for a term not exceeding five years or both. So that is very severe uh, penalty imposed. So in the situation 在遭受损失的情况下要求赔偿。当客户起诉这银行违反保密义务的时候,这赔偿的金额将取决于是否能确定因银行披露或者是透露它的信息而遭受的一个实际损失的情况。但这保密的义务呢，是在不论是你在任职期间还是之后，甚至是这个银行和这个客户在完全终止这个客户关系之后，这银这个保密的义务还是永永久性的，也是永远的。所以这违反金融服务法呢，这 in breach of financial services act 啊，是一个违反法律的一个。一个是一个违反法律，这处罚也是相当严重的。如果你看到这个处罚来说呢，在处罚是在这我们的金融服务法第一百三十三条，这里也写明这个处罚是不不超过是一千万马币，或者是监禁不超过五年，甚至是两者
or by our corporate clients? Hi, in answering these questions, as I mentioned earlier, first thing is to get a consent. So how do we get a consent from the corporate client, staff, and customer? What we need to do is, okay, in a, if for the corporate clients, usually if we want to work with them, we actually need to get a consent from the corporate clients that with a written format to say that the, the client has agreed, and uh, the client, we will usually have a disclosure clause as well as a PDPA clause. So in the PDPA clause, we can actually request this corporate client. We say that the corporate clients hereby agree and hereby uh, confirm that he has obtained the consent from his staff or all his customers, so, so it can be a list. He has actually, we need the corporate clients to confirm that he has already obtained the consent from the staff and the customers in order for them to liaise with the bank, in order for the banks to liaise with them. So we need a written disclosures that is allowed in order to allow the banks to liaise with the corporate clients as well as their staff and customers. I hope I answer your questions. Yeah. Thanks, Sandy, for answering this question. So I'm sure it's very helpful to Mr. Thor and also the attendees today. All right. Uh, we also allow the attendees to actually ask the questions directly. Yeah. So uh, now we allow um, Daniel to speak to our speaker for the question. You may speak now. Hi, Xiangli. Hi, Mr. Nam. Can you hear me? Yes, can yes. hear. Yeah. I, I have a few questions uh, posted by my colleagues. So uh, the first question is, okay, in the scenarios, right, when dealing with the listed companies, um, usually the customers do not really want to sign the PDBA form or PDBA consent form uh, because uh, their opinion is either the information is publicly available or in the non-disclosures agreements, there's a PDPA clause. So uh, just wonder, can we rely on the non-disclosures uh, PDPA clause uh, without asking customers to sign the uh, PDPA consent form? Yeah, uh, Manchan, maybe I can answer the questions. Yeah. Okay, Daniel, when you look into your questions, when dealing with the listed core, you have a non-disclosure agreement. So under the non-disclosure agreement, I believe you have specified in what extent, what are the things and to whom you can disclose to. So if that non-disclosure agreement itself has been sufficient to protect the banks or has been sufficient to allow the disclosure to be made by the bank, I believe there is not necessary to sign additional PDPA because we, when it comes to PDPA, if we are dealing with the company, we does not really need them to sign a personal data protection. So the personal data protections uh, agreement form is needed when it comes to dealing uh, with individual and for the listed call, we will usually request them to give permission to or to say that they allow or permit the bank or they have obtained the consent from the relevant uh, directors, uh, their directors, their managerial level people or the authorized person. So we need the, the company to actually uh, acknowledge that they have obtained the consent for the directors, for uh, all these authorized person, authorized personnel related to this matter. With that, if you cover that under your NDA, then you do not need additional PDPA form to be signed by the listed call. Is that uh, clear, Daniel? Yeah, yes, that clear? yes, yes, thank you very much, Sandy. So um, my second question is, um, okay, let's say, okay, another scenario is uh, two companies, two subsidiaries companies, uh, company A and company B. Company A's customer signed the PDBA consent form. Uh, in any chance that, and any chance will company B uh, is enabled to handle company A's uh, information? Uh, pardon me, sorry, I didn't hear clearly the, I understand the questions, they are talking about me, but not 
Yeah. So can, can I can I know what is this? Uh, can, you you can hear me, right? Can I know you said uh, what yeah. is the question again? The what the company B can deal with the information of company A. What is the questions uh, at the last? Because in certain scenarios, because in certain scenarios, but uh, the companies A, okay, companies A will use the. Okay, let's say the the customer signed the PDBA consent form. Then basically, companies A can uh, process and process the information and the process of personal data. Am I right? Okay. Then, right. um, but, yeah, but companies B, because companies A and companies B, uh, they are related companies. They are subsidiaries. Uh, uh, so just wonder, companies A can share the information to the companies B in order for the companies B to assist to process the data as well, or to utilize the data. Okay, company A and company B, B they are shareholders, uh, they, they are related call, they, are, they have a relate, uh, related company or they are shareholders of each other. Be that as it may, they, the, my simple answer is you cannot share the information obtained by company A to company B, unless when the PDPA form signed, uh, given by the customer to company A, that PDPA for, form itself include and allow the company A to disclose the information to any of its related companies. If there is this, then you can disclose. If there is none, then it is restricted to the information given to the disclosure and the permissions given to company A. Understand. My third question is in relation to the section 134 of the FSA. Uh, now we are looking at this. 11, uh, whereas it talks about the in connections with the applications for a grant of profit, letter administrations, or the distributions order. So any due diligence that the banks need to check or not, let's say a customer pass me a grant of profit or a letter of administrations. So what should I do as a banker? Uh, Dania, in this scenario, meaning you have already obtained the grant of probate or grant of LA, is it? Yes. Mm. In the scenario, if there is a grant of probate or grant of LA has already been extracted from the court and give it to the bank, uh, the only thing is whether, the only thing the due diligence that the bank will need to check is whether that court order or that grant of LA is authentic or not. If that court order is granted is authentic, to yeah, in most uh, I would say in most of the circumstances, uh, we will get the lawyer confirmations. The lawyer will write into the bank and closing the grant of LA and grant of probate. So with that, um, when the bank receiving that, uh, we will also then the bank may require some death death certificate, or the bank can also require the previous uh, cost paper which was submitted in, in order to ascertain whether the order is authentic. Uh, granted by the court. In the scenario when there is no lawyer appointed, uh, the bank may also look into uh, the extraction from the court order or the small asset uh, office. If let's say it's under a small asset, uh, the bank can actually uh, verify with the court uh, on the authenticity of the order. Once there is this order, I think the bank has discharged the duty in order to verify uh, further details because once it is obtained by the court, the court order that the banks has to be abide for. Uh. Mm. Understand. Understand. Okay. Uh, okay. My next question is, okay, during these pandemic seasons, uh, seasons, I mean, during these trying times, uh, if let's say we don't use message of trust, right, usually we will need to write our name and then our phone numbers in a, in a manual book. Mm -hmm. So just wonder, is it subject to PDPA as well? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure what do you think? So then you just mentioned that uh, our name and a number when you're entering the premise of bank, is it? No, unless it's a bank or to restaurants or whatsoever, or to a shopping mall. Okay, I think that that would fall under the guideline given by our National Security Council to fight the pandemic. So there's another another law governing that apparently. Hmm. Understand. Okay. So uh, my last question is. 
is okay when we talk about the personal data right personal data processed outside malaysia and not intended for further processing in malaysia is not applicable so my colleague would like to know what is the definitions of process what do you how you do you define process uh yeah, how do you define the process? That's mean, I mean, are we going to use the data for the further usage for marketing purposes? Is it called as the process as well? Uh, Manchan can, Manchan would like to, like to explain on the data processor part. Yeah. Uh, yeah, may need to unmute first. Sorry, Daniel. I, I totally miss you. Can you can you please repeat? I will just uh, quickly tick down. All right. Okay. Uh, personal data processed outside Malaysia and not intended for further processing in Malaysia is not applicable. So okay. uh, from my okay, my colleague's question is, how do you define process? Is it? I mean, we use the data uh, for marketing purpose. Is it categorized under process as well? Okay, I am okay. Processing is under PDPA's uh, definition. Of course, it's quite a long, long definition. Okay, I will I'll read from uh, whatever is in the section. Uh. Okay, it means collecting, recording, holding, or storing of personal data or carrying out any operation or set of operations of personal data. So basically, um, not to mention how you use by storing itself already, it is uh, defined as processing already so i'm quite sure it is uh is encapsulate under under pdpa understand okay i have no more further questions All right, thank you. So we saw that there is another participant, Mr. Thor, who actually raised his hand. So we allow you to speak now. access to our corporate clients, uh, say information of the staff, we need uh, the PDPA process of consent, etc. But let's say we have to access to their information by assigning our private staff on site at their office and analyze their staff information. Okay, can you hear me? Or it's not clear, is it? Can, can you hear you, you, you can't hear it. not very clear. Oh. Yeah, I... Maybe I forgot the Q&A question I posted already. The, the Q&A question? Uh, okay. Uh, Maybe can you Yeah, um, yeah, uh, Mr. To, are you referring to is assigning bank staff to work on site at corporate clients? Uh, yes. And yes. Finances? Oh, okay, the questions itself, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Via corporate client, the indirectly via corporate client. Okay, how how if your if your bank staff is allowed is allowed uh, with the bank's uh, permission to work on site at the corporate client's office. So when you are working for the corporate client's office, I believe there are some kind of agreement signed between uh, or employment or kind of a contract service signed between your, uh, the, the bank staff as well as the corporate client company. So since you are on site, you are by right working from the corporate clients, right? So you are allowed to access uh, their information. To what extent you can access? And if you are accessing to their client's information, I think yeah, you, you, you are allowed, you mean to their staff and, or customer 
indirectly meaning what? Meaning your own site purpose is what? If your own site purpose is not for you to offer your financial service to their staff and customer and you are not allowed to access, then that is not that that couldn't be done. That is not allowed. But if your on-site service, including to provide financial services to their staff and client, then you are allowed. So you don't have to like further to get a PDPA process because you are dealing directly with them. But when we are processing their data, when you went on to layers with the staff and customer, I believe if you are representing the bank, you will also need to get the PDPA uh, form to get them to sign. They agree to disclose the PDPA, the information to you before you can process. Yeah. Is that what you is that what you, you are looking at? Yeah. Is that clear your clear your doubt? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Okay, thank you. So now we move back to the Q&A chat box there. There is actually a question posted by Ariel Chua. The question is with regards to PDPA, we understand that there is a PDP class of data user order 2013 for specific class of data user to register with the personal data protection commissioner. If a company or a bank does not fall under the specific class of data user, in the order, but wish to voluntarily register, can they do so? And what is the pro and con of it? Okay, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll take this question. Okay, as of now, there is no um, a clause to talk about voluntary um, registration. But all in all, um, be it, be it um, doesn't it doesn't matter if you are you are you are. You are compulsory for you to register or not, um, data user is still uh, governed under PDPA Act. I mean, as for my personal opinion, since there's no voluntary registration, I think there's no harm um, by registering, okay, because uh, it's just to make sure the compliance, the seven principles are complied. I mean, that, that's basically about it. Hope you answer thanks, your Man. question. Oh, thanks, Manchan. Right. Um, Let's move on to the next question. The next question is posted by Jane Chong. The question is PDPA again, for PLC annual report disclosure required to disclose largest and major shareholders shareholding information, do we need to seek their consent? Uh, I believe there is also a link question uh, posted by Jane Chong as well. The question is also regarding the consent, which is the disclosure is made pursuant to MMLR issued by Bursa. Do we need to seek consent also? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Manchan, I'm just thinking in answering the questions for the PLC annual report disclosure required to disclose largest or major shareholders information. So who bears the duty to seek the consent? Yeah, so if let's say there is a need to disclose, uh, whenever if they are our clients, we have earlier, if that is individual clients or if that is a co corporate clients, we don't need the PDPA. So for the individual clients, I believe uh, when the banks prior to handling the matter, they have actually obtained the consent, a PDPA, PDPA consent from the borrower or from, from the clients already. So that's one. Then uh, I'm thinking if you are making the annual report disclosure, that you I don't think that you need to this you need to get the individual consent from each and every of the shareholders. You are only dealing with the main uh, customer, the main uh, client. So it's the main client's duty to disclose to the bank that we have all these shareholders. So the bank is relying the information from the main client in order to make the annual report. So, yeah, so that's what uh, my view. If Manchan has anything, you can just uh, add in. Uh, that I, 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 I do not have anything to add. Yeah. yeah. But I, I do have to I have something to add in relation to Ariel. I think we missed uh, her, her further question. She actually asked that if uh, a company or bank who does not fall under the specific class of data user, I mean, of course, um, also does not register with PDBC. Will they be prohibited to process any personal data? I think um, a short answer to that is no, they will not be prohibited to process. But of course, they 
we need to comply with the seven principles. Uh, this is a this is a general rule for everyone who process uh, personal data. Yeah, that, that's all. Uh, I also, yeah, sorry, I just a bit jump, jump back to Jen's uh, another question. Disclosure is made pursuant to MMLR issued by BRUSA. If let's say it is in compliance with the law and the disclosure is made pursuant to the uh, main market listing requirement issued by the BRUSA Malaysia, then that disclosure is allowed. So you don't have to seek additional consent. Thank you to Manchan and Sangli for answering the questions. So I believe this is very useful to all the attendees today. Now we are actually ending this section now. If the attendees are having more questions, you are welcome to email our speakers. The email is actually stated in the brochure. And I believe that that's all the time we have today. And this marks the end of our webinar. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, everyone. Take good care. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Stay safe.